I want to welcome you all and thank you for coming. And I also want to thank my wonderful fan club of friends, a couple of whom also ventured out this evening to join us, um, by which I feel very supported. Uh, I had intended to do this extemporaneously. And um, I'm not the world's best extemporaneous speaker. And I don't plan on doing my TED talk anytime soon. And so I'm going to try to read as if I were speaking extemporaneously, but I did finally knuckle down out of fear and write down a bunch of what I want to say. I hope that at the end we'll have time for questions and then the chat can be a little bit less formal. Also, I'd love it if we can lower the lights a little because it'll make it a little easier to see what I'm doing. So. Um, it's different to talk about one's work mid-career than earlier, uh, because one can see the long view and discern the persistence of a few major themes that seem to constitute what one is trying to say. Is that OK, better? I want to start by showing you um, a work titled Helmbrecht's Walk, which involved my retracing the steps of a forced march of women at the close of the Second World War. They were marched 225 miles from the town of Helmbrechts in Germany, uh, out of a small concentration camp, to Prahatica in the Czech Republic. And I see this work as pivotal for me because it was the beginning of a trajectory that has continued since that time, which was the mid-90s, to the present. Um, all of my work is concerned, I feel, with two big themes. Um, one is the singularity and specificity of sensate beings, their fragility, and the limitations of their physical bodies. And the other is the collision of the personal with the unforgiving forces of history. My parents survived the Holocaust in Europe and came to the United States in 1949. Their history and experience made a deep impression on me. I mean, you can imagine it was kind of the backdrop to my entire childhood, actually. By chance, they were born into the world of Eastern Europe on the eve of the attempt to exterminate European Jewry. And that one circumstance shaped not just their life, but mine. So now that I look at the various threads of my work, as they move through time, I can see that these two interests drive everything that I make. The black and white images of dead bodies stacked up like cords of wood discovered rotting in the concentration camps all over Europe are so deeply lodged in my memory that I don't remember a time when I didn't know about them. And they have crept out slowly in the form of new images meant to connect the present somehow with that past. Let's see if I can get this. Uh, oops. When I started showing after graduate school, the lingua franca of the art world was postmodernism. And I think that my work hewed pretty closely to that paradigm in that most of my work functioned as a form of indirect speech, speech that relied on quotation and references to literature, film, and photography. And I think while my interests were in some sense the same, the form they took was different, and that form does affect how meaning is produced and how it's received. Then, abruptly, in the 90s, the art market collapsed. With it went my sales, my gallery, which closed, and everything I had worked so hard for. But while this was a deep disappointment, it allowed something else to happen. And since there are no control experiments for life, I can never know what my work might have looked like had that not happened. But I began to consider my interests more closely. I wasn't interested in adding clutter to the world. I wanted to make my work occupy space in a different way. And I wanted to engage in my subject matter more directly. For me, the problem with indirect speech was the intimation that all this quotation was partially a fear that everything that could be said had already been said. Of course, this is an exaggerated statement, as some really important work came out of that period analyzing the way media functioned, 
uh, the pictures generations comes to mind as do many others. But the notion that it had all been said and needed to be formulated as quotation left me feeling a bit like a generic being. And I felt that what mattered about my work was always going to be in part that it was created by a singular constellation of DNA, circumstance, and experience. And I recognize that this sounds a bit 19th century of me. And in fact, uh, on the website I created for Helmbrecht's walk, I quote Gustav Fechner, who was born in 1801 and died in 1887, and who likens our, this is now a quote starting with likens, likens our individual persons on the earth unto so many sense organs of the earth's soul. When one dies, it is as if an eye of the world were closed, for all perceptive contributions from that particular quarter cease. Anyhow, Helmbrecht's walk was the first direct use of my body as part of a work, except for some early self-portraiture from the 70s that was lost. There were some precedents for the way I went about this in the art world in the works of Richard Long and Hamish Fulton, who mark time and space by indexing themselves into the landscape. But my work added a historical dimension to that process. When I completed this walk, I returned home and started to sort out all of the images and video. But it took me a while to create a cohesive presentation out of it. Eventually, a 48-plate portfolio emerged, along with a slide presentation and, much later, a comprehensive website. The images, as you will see, are in pairs, and each pair represents one day. One image is my POV looking forward, and the other my peripheral view. Each pair is accompanied by a text. One is a diary of my personal experience walking, and the other is a quote from the New York Times, generally called from the first few pages, describing an event occurring that same day. So we have the death of Pol Pot, which happened in 1998 when I was walking, the death of Octavio Paz, the hospitalization of Vaclav Havel. One friend described these news events as an ongoing obituary, pretty apt considering that the piece itself was one for these women in a sense, a non-monumental memorial. And if you go to my website, you will see that I was able to change the form. I'm going to actually show you a peek of that of the presentation somewhat so that the captions function differently, first invisible and then seen on top of a pentimento of that image. So basically what happened is that three kind of presentations evolved of this, um, of this work. Uh, hold on a second. So the first actually when it was presented in a gallery, the image was were shown not one above the other, but side by side. Uh-oh, we've got the slideshow running amok here on its own. Hold on, sorry. Ah. So they were shown initially side by side, so they were like a, you know, a book spread. And they were shown on the wall or ringing a room that way. Um, then when they were later published, in magazines and things like that, I ended up coming up with this format to kind of keep the text together because by that time I had also made a translation of the text into German. So what you see here, which you can't really read unless you go to my website, is the top is the diary, below is the news event, and then sandwiched in between and above the second text is the diary in German and the uh, news event in German. And this shows you day one, day seven. So all of this is just me walking down the road. It took me um, as many days as it took them, 22. I started and began and ended where they did historically, 53 years earlier. This is day seven. And this is toward the end, um, day, I think, 20. So this is something, if you're curious about it and want to read the text, which is actually fairly important to the work, you can go on the site and see that there. And 
just very briefly, this is the entrance to the website. And I can just show you one example of the way it functions on line is kind of nice because I was able to create a rollover text. So here the relationship of the text and the image is somewhat different because you're able to see just the visual image. And then if you place your cursor here, you see that image fade into the background like a pentimento and the text appear above it. And there's a German version and, uh, and an English version to look at. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so now at this point, uh, the work has a life of its own. It's included in several books. It's traveled as an exhibition. It exists as a website, as you see, and it is the subject of ongoing talks, articles, and dissertations. The exhibition was also accompanied by a slide presentation of the graves of the 95 women who died along the march route. Again, I think this inclusion represents the effort to maintain the singularity of the women who perished. And we see this strategy in the brilliant Vietnam Veterans Memorial by Maya Lin in Washington, and often repeated in the reading of names at the World Trade Center and other sites of loss. So this is uh, an example. There was a cemetery that was the allies forced upon this little town in the Czech Republic that they didn't really want. And um, I photographed every single headstone there. And I'll, I'll give you a little sampling of some of them here. The neznama is actually means unknown. So there were also women, <coughs> excuse me, buried there who were never identified. The curious thing about the cemetery was that I first had a little trouble finding it when we got to Volare. And um, I looked around and I found the town cemetery and there was just no sign of this place. And then as I was leaving, I passed a huge um, like line of big tall trees. And there, past that line of trees was the cemetery. And evidently what happened was that the town, which was not very happy about housing this cemetery, planted a row of trees to try and separate these Jewish women from the rest of the town cemetery. Um, and as the trees grew, they succeeded actually in, in doing that. And on top of that, they, of course, there were no Jews left in the town or anywhere within range to maintain this cemetery. So the question became, what would motivate somebody to maintain it with all these strangers buried there? So they buried a Soviet worker in the cemetery, and his stone, which I'm not going to show you here, is uh, in Cyrillic writing, and it's in amongst these women. And so basically, they were maintaining the cemetery, I guess, for his sake, is what kind of happened. Um, a little bit silly, but that's what happened. Um, so anyway, one of the other things that was important to me, or is important to me, is the perception of time and ideas about personal time versus historical time, memory versus fact. So one additional thing I did on my walk was to shoot a master shot of the landscape on video every single day. And when I arrived at the end of the march route, I also retraced it in reverse in a car and shot a video traversing that landscape at a much different speed and from back to front, essentially. So the master shots are paired with excerpts of the video shot from the car for each day, such that one video is moving, in theory, forward through time, and the other is, at least metaphorically, moving backward. And at some point in the middle, presumably, they cross each other because I was going this way in one and that way in the other. And, um, and the second video almost functions as a memory of the first. Less detail, more of a dreamscape. And I think it is a commentary on what happens to the accumulations of facts within personal experience over time. And of course, it is in essence not my memory and not my experience, 
or better put, my experience is completely incommensurate to that of those women. And walking through that landscape gave me no greater understanding of what their experience was than sitting at home trying to imagine it. And I want to show you just a little sample of that. Um, okay, so here you're going to see the first day and how this works. So this is just day one, and as you wind your way through the um, website, you would see all 22 days. And right now, in a way, you're looking at the very beginning of the trip and the very end, and they would eventually crisscross somewhere in the center. Um, so now in 2000, I uh, had a serendipitous encounter with a sparrow. I found it dead on the sidewalk outside my gym, and it was still kind of warm and soft. I mean, it had just obviously fallen out of the sky. Um, and eventually, after a long bout of staring at this thing, I took it home. And this began what has become an ongoing series of images of dead birds, um, some showing periods of gradual decay, and others showing them manipulated in various ways or depicted together with birds of other species that they would never be seen together with in nature. Uh, while I was very cautious with my subjects at first, I think squeamish is probably a better word, um, I grew bolder about manipulating them as I went along, um, probably more comfortable. And I made several works with movement, including a stop action animation, which I'm going to show you, and several short HD videos, one of which I will show you. And again, I feel that the work was at least in part about rehabilitating their singularity and beauty. It wasn't until I was working on these images for some time that I came to see their connection with the works I had made about the Holocaust. And then let me start by showing you this particular set of images was made in, uh, I think, about 2007. Uh, come on, let's see. Okay, here we go. So this is a not super early, but earlier example. They're pretty in focus up there. It's sort of hard to tell. It's a little unfortunate having them backlit because um, on paper these things actually look like they have a certain amount of dimension because the, with an inkjet print, print um, especially on a flatter paper, they look, you know, the ink kind of sits on the surface and they look very dimensional as images. And many of these series were set up as portfolios that are actually in boxes, so they're set up kind of like print portfolios. So all of these images are titled Found Birds, or from the series Found Birds, and 2000 to the present, and then each individual 
portfolio has a name. This one is called The Bird from Ellen's Yard. Because one thing that started to happen and is still happening to me is that once people got to know that I was doing this, I get phone calls from people. I found a bird in my yard. I found a bird on the, you know, crashed into our window. And um, so I have a lot of people giving me birds to uh, <laughs> photograph. And then I'm going to show you a more recent example. These images were uh, recently shown in Los Angeles, and they're actually much bigger, and they were set up as frame prints. Um, and this is from, also from that series, and the prints are called Raven. And here they're actually set up to kind of look a little bit like they're in motion. But this is a, a dead raven that also was found by a friend and put in her freezer till I could come and get it. So these were large scale prints, they were about 32 by 45. sort of Edgar Allan Poe one, I think. And then I would like to show you two of the <coughs> video pieces from this. Let's see. This is called well, Embrace, as you shall see. And this is actually a stop action animation, so it's made up of all still images. I'm going to do that one more time because it happens very fast. <laughs> Most people are like, can you do that again? And then I'll show you one of the videos. Well, they're all, all these are quite short. This one is quite recent. It's called The um, Woodpecker's Dream. And for some reason, I couldn't get this into a better format. So we're going to, oh, no. Maybe we're not going to see this one. Hmm, I have another idea. Might be small, but let's see. Uh, mostly, as you can see, I've when I'm photographing birds, they aren't alive, but I applied for a residency in the Everglades with the idea in mind that I wanted to find a dead pelican, a really big bird. And I spent eight months fighting with the Fish and Wildlife Commission who, in their infinite wisdom, do not believe that art is as important as science and that an artist could not possibly have a reason to collect specimens in the park. So I thought about abandoning the residency altogether and then I thought, well, I'll fly down to Florida, and I'll just buy a one-way ticket. And if I hate it there, I'll just get right back on an airplane and come back, because I had no idea what I was going to do there. Well, I got down there, and I discovered that, um, and it was August, the worst month. They also, I asked for February, they gave me August. So there were millions of mosquitoes. It was just crazy down there. But anyway, it turned out to be an environment that I totally loved. And I was invited to photograph the collection of the South Florida Collections Management Center, which are dead birds that are very different than the ones I normally shoot. They're, you know, they're kind of stuffed and preserved, and they were found in the park. But at the same time, there were all these live birds in the park, mostly enormous vultures and crows. And so for a month, I basically spent uh, my time chasing them around the park, and I got to know where they like to hang out. And um, one of the things I've done with those images, I'm not kind of fully done dealing with them, is that I took these images of these enormous birds and I plugged them into billboards 
so that they become these sort of majestic, enormous birds that you would not normally see in an urban environment, particularly in you know, Los Angeles or New York. And um, I'm going to show you how that looks. And I have also was asked to submit this as a proposal for the realization of an actual billboard in Miami. It was presented by the residency program there um, to the Knight Foundation. And it is in the final round. So it may be on a billboard soon in Miami if you are down there. Um, and so this is what this looks like. This is Los Angeles. And that's a vulture there. This is a set of crows. This is also Los Angeles. This is actually oddly the Mekong Delta. I happened to shoot this billboard when I was there because I liked the fact that it was in the middle of nowhere in the water. And actually, there was nothing on it. Um, and all of these images are called flight. This is, you probably recognize Soho and Houston, Houston and Lafayette. This is also Lafayette Street. And this is Bowery, I guess. Okay. So, on onward. In the late 70s, I had taken a series of black and white portraits of myself. The photographs and the negatives were lost many years ago. But some of them reappeared when my mother's house was emptied and sold about two years ago. All the negatives were gone, but a few black and white prints were found in a box and returned to me after she moved. I was delighted to see them again, especially since I had returned by a somewhat circuitous route to the project of photographing myself. I was interested in the peculiar cultural productions that bind us together as a generation and distinguish one generation from the next. And I was struck by the fact that I could remember the theme songs to so many shows that I watched on television as a kid. And this is all pre-MTV, my generation. I decided to sing those songs to myself in front of a large mirror. So I sang the theme songs to Bat Masterson, Rawhide, Yogi Bear, the Mickey Mouse Club, and many others. I also did the Star Trek intro speech and the Superman speech, which I knew by heart, uh, among other things. And the resulting tape was shown in Los Angeles. It's called The Child of 60s Television, Singing Songs That Got Stuck in Her Head. Anyway, the process of making this video required taking numerous still photographs to figure out where the camera needed to be, where I needed to be, where the pl plane of focus would be. I also am a really bad singer. I can't sing, which I think gave the tape some real pathos. And so there were like a million takes before I could get a song out and make it sound halfway credible. Anyways, these images accumulated. I became interested in them in and of themselves. And so 30 years or so after I produced my first series of black and white self-portraits, I began shooting self-portraits again. This work has become an important ongoing exploration for me, examining the middle-aged face and body and the passage of time, recurring themes for me. Because uh, the images are all shot in front of a mirror, I think they also raise uh, questions about identity, privacy, and self-intimacy. And I'm going to show you two sets of these images. Also, the piece that you saw walking into the room in the beginning is part of that um, body of work. This is an early series of these images. I did get asked on numerous occasions if I had a twin. And a lot of people mistook this to be two different people, which I found incredibly interesting. Because if I didn't set up what you were about to see, people actually did kind of misunderstand what they were looking at. And then I'm going to show you uh, a set of more recent images, because this is ongoing. 
um, that were a, a few excerpts of which were recently shown at Memento in Brooklyn. So these were made a couple of years later. And they were, these were shown actually in a two-person show with another artist whose work I very much like, Joy Episala, and we did a book together. So there's also a book, and you can sort of peek it. Uh, I think it's a printed matter. Really. Um, then, sort of three or so years into the process of doing this, um, I added a, a new dimension to it, which was that I started to shoot images uh, for what I consider to be a personal diary um, called Love in the Ruins, Sex Over 50. Um, I think part of my thinking in doing that was that um, you don't see much of that kind of imagery that we see and think about sex is happening between much younger people. Um, and I'm going to show you a few images of that and a few, I guess, installation images of a solo show that was in Bushwick in March. And um, the show resulted actually in a very lovely review, which is on hyperallergic and also in uh, an interview I did with a new magazine called Adult Magazine. I think we'll start with the installation images and then I'll show you a few close-up shots. So this is Studio 10 in Bushwick. There were eight large-scale prints in the show. These are about 32 by 46. And then I can show you just a couple of shots of the actual images. Okay. Oh, they're big over there. <laughs> <laughs> kind of shocking. Okay. Funny because I think of them a little bit as I, I see them as very formal images too, and as landscapes. And I noticed that there was a young person from your one of your colleagues or peers who has some Im images downstairs that are more abstracted, but that they think of as landscapes that are obviously the body. And I thought that was quite interesting because I enjoyed seeing your show downstairs in the lobby <coughs> level. Okay, um, so things that you could sort of look up on your own that I'm just going to mention very briefly is that I worked from 2006 to 2010 on a project in eastern Hungary documenting the world's largest mayfly, which uh, emerges, emerges from the Tisza River and swarms the river once a year. And I was struck by the pathos of the shortness of their existence, only three hours and by the beauty and frenzy of their mating and dying in that short time. And I had gone there a number of times, and it was one of the few artworks I've ever done where there wasn't a plan ahead of time. It was kind of an impulse deal. And then I didn't know what to do with this, all this stuff. 
And in the end, it seemed to me that the artwork was actually going to be the website, that that's how it would live and exist in the world. And I think it actually turned out quite well. You can find it under SusanSilas.com listed, and you can also find it as TisaRiverProject.com. And the web did some other favors for me, because I also have, in a section on my website called Odds and Ends, um, other things I wasn't sure what to do with, because I couldn't figure out prior to the web how to create a place to put these things where the text was longer than a caption in relation to the image. And the web really solved that problem for me. So I have some fun little things accumulating in that section of my site. Um, I also want to mention two other things. One is that I do write for hyperallergic, which has been a fun thing. And as you guys are students, when I was a student, I was advised to do this because I could write. And I didn't want to because at the time, I thought that if I wrote, I would be mistaken as a writer. And a real artist doesn't write, they make art, and these are separate enterprises. And I didn't want to be in that position, particularly since the person recommending it was more known as a writer than a painter. And so I, I was afraid of that. I think the art world has changed so dramatically since then, and that everything that you do counts. And it feels very comfortable to be doing both these things, whereas it did not feel that way a long time ago. And while there's also a lot of criticism of the fact that, you know, writing about art has become kind of endless press releasing and everybody says positive things, um, and I'm a little bit guilty of that in that as an artist rather than a professional critic, I've been choosing to write about the things I like. And I feel that it's up to the critics who are professional critics to write the negative reviews. It's not that I don't have any, I just don't feel like that's my job. I want to support the artists that I care about rather than be in the position of a professional critic. Um, I also want to mention that um, with another artist whose work I very much love, Chris Ann Stathikos, we started a blog in, I want to say February 2012. And the blog is an appreciation of women artists who've been working for over 20 years. And we've interviewed seven or eight women so far. I think it's a great site. It's based on, um, again, an interview format. And we're about to publish our next one in the coming week of Sylvia Kolbowski, which I think is a very interesting and good interview. And I want to close with a very short video um, that was inspired by two films, actually, both of which have as their subject matter the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When I photographed birds of different species together, you didn't see that, it's on the site, there are more images, um, predators and prey, because I sometimes have images of birds actually embracing each other that are of different species and would never ever be seen together in nature like that. I was thinking about this conflict and the way in which it seems to have no possible resolution in real time. And I felt that the images that I created represented a hope for reconciling the unreconcilable. Now, each of these films was made, I think, in the last year or so, or shown at least in the last year or so. And it, each film examines the relationship of a young Palestinian male and an Israeli Secret Service or Shin Bet handler. And in each case, the Palestinian boy has been entrapped into this relationship. One is told from the Israeli point of view by an Israeli filmmaker and the other from the Palestinian point of view. And the films are Omar by Hani Abu Assad and Bethlehem by Yuval Adler. And I actually recommend that you see them both. Um, I'm going to just show you this little video that they inspired. Let me make this bigger.
And uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for coming. And I'm hoping you guys will ask some questions. Um, so maybe we can get the lights a little higher and see if anyone has anything they want to ask. A good question. Again, of course, there's no control experiment. But um, I would say certainly that had something to do with it. On the other hand, obviously not all Holocaust survivor children are artists. I also think that, I do think that a lot of art or motivations for making art and speaking come from a place of loss, not all, um, and that that's a pretty big contributing factor. And I would say that the loss of my father at a very young age was probably even more significant in that way. And again, you know, everybody's comes to it from a different place. You know, some people come to it f just from unbelievable facility, say, you know, and a drive to make a thing. You know, so it's, it's different for different people. But for me, I would say it's that, and I think that is the reason why a lot of people are motivated to make art and write literature and play music. You know, it's funny. I think, yes, I think people are expected in the art world these days to have a brand. <laughs> and um, I'd like to think that, uh, you know, maybe Bruce Nauman can be an example of the brand being whatever I do is it. Um, but I do think, honestly, that thematically, all these works are very tightly connected. They look really different, it's true. But if you sort of dig into them, they are a lot about you know, the, our perception of time. They are a lot about the intersection of the personal with political events and historical events. Um, and they are a lot about the frailty of the human body, so, and other bodies. No, it was fantastic, actually. I don't want to tell you what's in the freezer at the moment. There's quite a contingent <laughs> waiting for, <laughs> for, uh, uh, another thing that I'm about to work on with them, but um, it was actually very helpful, you know, because it takes, obviously I'm not out there killing these poor things, so it takes a while to run into one, and if, you know, that can be augmented by friends, it's fantastic. I guess there, first of all, I guess pornography would be, to my mind, defined by how you use it. <laughs> So if people are sitting jerking off to those images, then that's porn for them, I get, you know, obviously. What's happened with those images is kind of interesting. I don't think of them as pornography, although they're semi-explicit, and there's some more explicit than others. Um, but because they're online now, and I kept them offline for a long time because my daughter was still at home, and I didn't want her friends at school looking at this stuff. I didn't want her school teachers looking at this stuff. So I didn't show it till she went off to college, basically, or attempt to show it. But now that it's online, it's actually migrated to some strange websites. It's shown up, um, because I get hit from those places. So it's shown up on a site, for example, called Indie Nudes, that is a combination of artists' websites that show nudity and you know, down and dirty porn. Um, so, like, Ryan McGinley is on that website, right? Uh, it's, it shows up on other, you know, other kinds of places. And I do have one great funny anecdote, actually, about, <laughs> about something that happened because of this, which was um, I was reading an article in the very distinguished New York Review of Books, and it mentioned that, you know, everyone was so shocked when in Abbottabad, they found all this pornography in the hands of Osama bin Laden after he'd been killed. And a professor who's being interviewed in this article says, oh, that's nothing. It's, it was actually an Orthodox Jewish guy. That's nothing. You should just go Google Middle Eastern porn. It's everywhere. So I get up from the <laughs> kitchen table, wander to the computer, Google Middle Eastern porn, and bing, up come zillions of websites. So I just tap on one, and it's this kind of 
Zoftig looking woman with a guy, they have pubic hair, they have body hair, they look like the stuff that got sent to Larry Flint at Hustler in the 70s, right? And I'm thinking, well, that's interesting. And I shut the thing and I, that's it. So then, that's all I did. The next day when I'm looking at Stat Counter, which shows the you know, rear end of my site, where are people coming from? It's like a hit from the United Arab Emirates, and it goes straight to the page that says sex over 50. And I think, well, that's weird. How did that happen? And then I think, well, it must be a coincidence. And then, like two days later, there's like Doha and Pakistan. And it goes on like this, hundreds and hundreds of hits. So somehow, by putting in, you know, somewhere there was an exchange took place between my computer and something out there, but I, I didn't even, you know, my IP address is not the same as the servers, and I didn't launch it from my website, and I didn't identify that page, but something happened that I can never explain. I get hundreds and hundreds of hits from the Middle East. <laughs> right? So I feel like I'm an ambassador to, uh, <laughs> you know, some kind of liberalization of the Middle East. And boy, are people interested in this. And why, I don't know. Are they coming to see porn? Are they coming to, I don't know what they're coming to see exactly. Because it says sex over 50. Or if this is like old codgers trying to figure out how, how they're going to continue with their sex life. I have no idea. No idea. You know, I, I don't think of it that way. You know, I think of pornography as something else. I think that there's, there's a lot of erotic imagery throughout history, and I would probably s make a separation, but I don't know exactly how I would define it for you. You know, I mean, I don't think of Hustler Magazine as art particularly. <laughs> so, and I don't think of the old Playboy magazines as that either. I think they served a very interesting function in American culture, but art wasn't it. I don't think you can. A, I don't think you can control entirely how anyone's going to respond once you put something out in the public realm. Um, and people come to it with different cultural values, different moral values, different religious values, and I can't control any of that. I mean, obviously I have intention when I make something, but there's a limit to the control that I have over how it's received. I wouldn't say I have absolutely no control, but I've, you know, I don't have a lot of control. You know, it, it's because it's a kind of yes and no thing. I think what I'm trying to say is that it didn't help me imagine their circumstances, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. That I think that their situation was so dire and different from my day-to-day -day experience that it was no easier to imagine when I put myself in that situation. Yeah, my feet hurt, but I went to a hotel at the end of the day. I knew I was safe. Did you um, that guy? I just caught that one little bit. Yeah, I, there were a couple of weird incidents where I, I was a little bit concerned, but, um, you know, their situation was so dire that I don't feel like I can really make that leap into that place very easily, um, despite being tired, despite all the other things, despite traveling that distance. I don't think that that's what w one gets. I mean, I think one gets a window into a historical moment, perhaps. One gets um, the sense of the way in which these things are erased because the witnesses to it are a bunch of trees, essentially, um, and how unmarked a lot of it is. And then maybe that makes us more conscious about what's going on around us that's unmarked. But, you know, so it's maybe a more reflective and philosophical thing that you get. I don't think you get a, oh, now I get what they went through. I, I, mean, I just don't think that would happen. No, it was the fact is that they were all women. That was what 
drew me to it. My father, as it happens, walked a very long way in a <laughs> situation not so dissimilar from that, um, from the Don River in Russia all the way back to Budapest. But uh, So there was some personal connection in a more abstract way. But to this specific march, no, although a large number of the women were Hungarian Jews. So that was another kind of peripheral connection. But I chose it because they were all women. And I feel like if you look at the history of the Holocaust and what's been written, with some major exceptions like Charlotte Delbo and Ida Fink, the history of the Holocaust has been written mostly by Western men. Um, and those are the people whose names we recognize, like Elie Wiesel, for example. Um, and, not, and we don't recognize the women as much. And we don't know as much about their experience either. About the Holocaust? Ida Fink is an absolutely incredible short story writer. I mean, her, her stories, I think there are maybe two collections, are incredible. And Charlotte Delbo is an incredible writer. And she wrote, I think her book is called Auschwitz and After. She was in Auschwitz. But she, she was not a Jewish prisoner. She was a uh, political prisoner, French political prisoner. But all the same. Her experience is quite remarkable, and she's a very smart, interesting woman. And I would recommend reading her book. One, yeah. You know, she was amazing. I didn't want to interview her before I went, or anyone before I went, because I wanted to be open to the experience of going and to seeing what I got out of that without knowing too much about the interpersonal uh, experiences of others. And when I got to the end of the walk, I ended up meeting the mayor of Volari, who, with his wife, created a little museum dedicated to these women. It's like a room about the size of this table. But it's kind of amazing. They did this all themselves. There's a, you know, there are pictures in there uh, and a real attempt to memorialize this. And he had a photograph of a reunion that took place three years before on the 50th anniversary where a group of the women who were still alive were invited to plant trees as a kind of memorial thing. Then it turned out that the person giving the trees was uh, from Germany and there was all this upset among the women and it was a, you know, there was kind of a big to-do. But the picture showing all these women showed one woman who looked remarkably young to me. Because as it turned out, she had been in the camp when she was 14. And she was actually 70 when I met her, but she looked about 60. And I looked at that picture and I thought, I want to meet this woman. And on the back, it told you like, who they were and where they lived. And she lived in New Jersey. So when I came back, I called her and I ended up spending about seven hours with her, two hours of which is recorded and is on the website. And you can see her speaking. She's an incredible woman, Helena Kleiner. Well, in, the f in 1956, and, and after that, actually, in my memory, um, our basement was basically would harbor people that left Hungary and came to try to make their way in America, usually distant cousins or whatever they were, all of whom wanted to see um, Dr. Zhivago. <laughs> so I saw it so many times in high school, you can't even imagine. And, um, When that was happening, obviously, I wasn't, uh, I was barely born. And um, I think that my, you know, my family looked at it as, uh, I guess, a sort of tragic event. But um, they were all here by then. So they weren't really so affected by it. And we didn't have that many relatives left there. They were all killed. So, you know, it, it, it affected some people we knew. but. It was a, a little bit distant in that sense, till people started to try and escape and get out. And then, you know, we had this sort of basement thing going. It's very moving, actually, to watch the footage of these people trying to fend off uh, Russian tanks, you know, and upsetting, <laughs> needless to say. And it's very sad what's happening in Hungary now, if you pay attention, because the government there is basically a neo-fascist government. It's a, just horrible. I 
guess I wasn't thinking about it as um, how long they would be. They just se it just seemed like that was all that was required somehow. Again, yeah. I mean, I hope that that doesn't create, it's not my intention to create a situation where they get fetishized if that's, if that's part, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, I could see how that would be like, oh, show it again, show it again. It, it really wasn't that. I think with the stop animation, it was really that partly I hadn't done it before. You know, I'd taken a lot, I thought I had taken a lot of photographs, but when they were all put together, you know, it doesn't amount to much. It takes a lot, a lot, a lot of photographs to make a longer stop animation video. But there was also something great about this kind of quick and instantaneous embrace that happens in it, um, that it's just a, a momentary flicker because in fact, of course, these creatures aren't alive anymore. It's almost like I've given them a split second of some kind of false life and then they're back to being gone. Well, it's interesting because when I put the um, video, the first video, I don't, I don't know if you were here yet, the, as people were coming in of the video of my face and when I've shown it, it's been about life size. But when it went up there and it was huge, it did seem sort of wrong. Like I'm used to seeing it on a screen that really represents about the size of my face. You know, and, and I do think that especially in the current climate of the art world, things just get bigger and <laughs> bigger. And yeah, it's about, and it's a kind of false gravitas some of the times, although sometimes it's appropriate. both types um, so that there's another piece that's on the subject of the show that's a six channel video that includes my um, daughter who's I guess sort of standing in for me because I felt like I was too old to do that piece by singing myself and she sings a lot better than I do and it was good to transmit this information from to the next generation in a sense so I think that I'm still making works in both registers, both the, the things that you define, you know, things that are more, a little bit more socially specific and things that are slightly less so. I think that both, all of these threads are ongoing, I would say. We're all good? Um, well, I really appreciate you guys coming and I've enjoyed talking to you and I hope that you'll peek at the website and look at other things because there's lots there. Thank you. Thank you.